1648 part 2 we look at effects of war and the seas and what effects they have on each other and this episode of Sabaton History is being shot during the corona pandemic of 2020. I'm Indy Nidell filming from isolation in Bavaria. I'm Pai from Sabaton and I'm filming from isolation in Moscow. And this is Sabaton History. Sixteen forty eight was the year the Thirty Years' War ended, and that war was not just marked by great violence, but also great outbreaks of disease. That year was also near the end of the endemic series of European plagues that began with the Black Death in the 1340s. So today I'm going to talk about war and disease in general. We are not too far past the centennial of the end of the Great War, one of the deadliest conflicts in the history of the world, where many millions of people died from bullets, shrapnel, gas, famine, and disease. However, the death toll of that war was soon surpassed by that of a pandemic so deadly that it still lives strongly in our memory today a century later, the Spanish flu. In the spring of 1918, the international news agency Reuters released the first reports from Spanish hospitals that they were seeing a communicable disease conceivably of epidemic proportions. And as the months rolled on, the death toll indeed grew to staggering numbers. Hundreds of thousands of soldiers and civilians had to be hospitalized. A second, deadlier wave of the flu struck in the autumn, just as the war was reaching its end. Now. The Meuse-Argonne Offensive was the bloodiest battle for Americans during the war, claiming the lives of 26,000 U.S. soldiers. But the flu killed around 45,000 more of them behind the front lines. That is just small potatoes. Globally, for much of the fall of 1918, some 300,000 people are killed by the disease each day. Overall, more than 500 million people around the world, and possibly many more than that, would catch the flu, and the death toll lies somewhere between 40 and 100 million people. To this day, though, historians disagree on where it originated. Some say Kansas in the United States, others place it in China, or even a field hospital in northern France. It was called the Spanish flu, or Spanish lady, by the news agencies because initially only neutral nations like Spain reported it. The warring nations all had heavy censorship of anything that might damage morale. But that, of course, delayed the response of their health authorities. Historians are also still unsure if the influenza had a decisive impact on the outcome of the Great War. I personally, as a World War I historian, do not think that it did. Others disagree. Yet to this day, laboratories run bacteriological and virological tests on preserved bodies from that era to better understand disease epidemics and pandemics. Theses about herd immunity, mandatory quarantine, and plague circulation are based on our experiences in the past, from times when vaccines or antivirals did not exist. As two of the four horsemen of the apocalypse, war and pestilence are seldom far from each other. Even in one of the earliest known works of literature, Homer's Iliad, there is a plague of some sort. Homer might have had a basic understanding of medicine, but his audiences did not. So the cause of the disease, which strikes the Hellenic armies in front of the Trojan walls, is of unnatural and divine origin. A kidnapped priestess evoked the anger of a god, which unleashed a foul miasma of death and disease to engulf the offenders' camps. Like being struck by invisible arrows, the Greek soldiers are cut down and the funeral fires burn unceasingly. It is the explanation of an archaic and classical world trying to make sense of that which man could not combat. Bound by fear and hopelessness, they attributed the disease to the wrath of a higher power. A millennium later, the mighty warriors of Athens who faced Persian or Spartan armies without fear were struck down mercilessly by disease during the Peloponnesian War. Thucydides describes the symptoms in detail. High fevers, swollen tongues, blistered skin, black throat and yellow spittle. The streets were filled with disfigured sick people cursing the gods. 
because they did not understand whence their torment came. And the doctors died as quickly and as often as their patients. Wars could not be fought under such circumstances. Mass troops of men confined in camps and forts were an ideal breeding ground for any infectious disease. And epidemics drained the fighting strength of armies on a scale that no enemy could and affected the civilian populations around them, sometimes on a massive scale. Medieval Europe was most devastatingly struck by the Black Death, the plague. While we use plague to refer to a plague of something, it is actually a specific disease, one of the deadliest and most virulent communicable diseases known to man. Striking Central and East Asia in the 1330s and 1340s and reaching Europe in 1347, it would continue to haunt the world for centuries to come. Pre-plague European population levels, for example, were not reached again until after 1500. But despite the chaos, humanity was making progress when it came to understanding pandemics. Physicians drew connections between people traveling and the epicenters of disease. To prevent sickness from spreading, authorities imposed sanitary cordons around affected cities and areas, placing them under quarantine. There was still a lot of superstition. People took to religion to be spared or cured of the unknown sickness. Infected individuals were, were branded as cursed or, or plague bearers and denounced and shunned. Scapegoats like minorities, criminals or perceived heretics fell victim to bloody reprisals. Nonetheless, quarantines were, for a long time, the only way to effectively fight pandemics. But in wartime, soldiers must still move from place to place. The Italian plague from 1629 to 1631 was part of a new wave of the Black Death, which was brought by traveling mercenaries during the Thirty Years' War. Cities like Milan, Florence, and Venice lost up to a third or even half of their populations. And there was also a devastating economic recession. That plague might well have accelerated the downfall of Northern Italy as the economic powerhouse of Europe. The world was not quite free from the plague even after that. During the Great Northern War at the beginning of the 18th century, East Central Europe and the Baltics were struck by a strain of plague. Coming from the southeast, it spread through Poland, Prussia, and Scandinavia. The density of the big cities and trade hubs, as well as the massed armies marching the land, soon left whole areas ruined by the spread of the disease. Where the soldiers marched, disease followed. From the supply lines, contaminated goods were transported to local merchants. Marauding soldiers brought the plague to remote villages and the cities, well fortified to withstand even the strongest siege, succumbed quickly to sickness. Where the four horsemen struck, people suffered. But humanity as a whole still survived and made further progress. Although medical record keeping was poor and diagnostic analyses lacked professional standards, in addition to the quarantines, specialized plague houses and plague doctors were established to actively fight the spread of disease. For a time, even the whole Duchy of Prussia was put under quarantine and several Danish isles were isolated from the rest of the world. The well-known Charité Hospital of Berlin was built in 1710 in front of the city walls to fight another possible outbreak of the plague. But looking at war and disease, until the end of the 19th century, it was common during any war that far more soldiers perished due to infectious diseases than from the actions of their enemies. The American Civil War is often studied in that regard, being a major, large-scale war fought not long before modern germ theory and bacteriology really took root. Two-thirds of the deaths during that war can be traced to the lack of proper sanitary conditions and inadequate dietary ones that were responsible for the spread of various epidemics. Even without a major pandemic, uncontrolled infectious diseases like pneumonia, typhus, dysentery, and malaria caused hundreds of thousands of deaths. In the 20th century, major advances in medicine began changing that model. Vaccines and antibiotics began to prevent and treat diseases before they became such a problem. 
And although it had its fair share of trench fever and outbreaks of typhus, malaria, or other infectious diseases in areas like the Balkans, Africa, and the Middle East, the Great War did not have the epidemic disease numbers of major wars of the past. The horrible conditions in the trenches where men lived and slept for weeks on end by their own waste, the wounded men, rotting corpses, excrement, rats, flies, lice, and fleas, all this would have led to major epidemics or pandemics in the past. But modern medicine and the advances in nutrition and sanitation mostly prevented that. Well, at least until the Spanish flu hit. Even now in the 21st century, with our medical standards, our vaccines, and chemo prophylaxis, it is easy to forget that most of humanity's history was deeply and permanently affected by plagues, infectious diseases, and deadly pandemics. When we talk about war, though, it is easier to explain it away. We can try to understand the motives, the whys and hows of people fighting and killing each other, but disease doesn't play by the rules or by moral codes. It doesn't care about rich people or poor people. It doesn't take sides or play favorites. People can be healthy today and sick tomorrow. People infect others before they themselves even show symptoms. And for us historians, or for those interested in history in general, we can observe and we can show similarities or differences with the past that may help in the confinement or treatment of a disease. We can warn people of the dangers of falling back into the archaic mindset, that there has to be some mystical power that set this plague upon us with evil intentions, that it is others' fault for our misfortune, that travelers or groups do not need to worry about spreading the illness, that it's out of our hands. And that is understandable. People are afraid, and rightly so, and that can easily create denial and scapegoats. But like the people of the past, we must endure and simply do our best to help each other with whatever tools we have and stop a disease from spreading in the first place. And if that is impossible, to confine and isolate it where and when we can. That is our obligation to each other. Okay, so now I've talked a lot about the effects of a pandemic on war. Now, Per, maybe you can tell them a little bit about the effects of a pandemic on tour. <laughs> yeah, and unfortunately, it's not so nice. I mean, we live very close to each other. We live in tour buses uh, and travel around in so many different countries, meeting a lot of new people every day. So it's... Uh, it's uh, common saying and uh, we learned it uh, the hard way on the first tour we ever did in a tour bus that if somebody gets sick we all get it on the uh, last tour uh, in europe the great tour of europe in 2020 actually we had to isolate people in the beginning due to flu at this time nobody really knew uh, and thought about so much about the corona because this was in January 2020 and Corona was a thing that was mainly existing over in China at this time. But it's also, you know, a part of our job as musicians and you know it well, you know, we can't really call the day. We, we are sick and we have to do the show. Yeah, yeah. But it is funny that sometimes, you know, if you have like a really nasty cold or a flu or something and you feel rotten and you feel terrible just before the show, as soon as you're on stage for that hour, hour and a half, you feel fine. And then you go off stage and you feel like crap again. It's, it's really cool that that works. You just don't notice that you're sick for like an hour and a half. I mean, all of us in, in the band, we have had a lot of different uh, uh, sicknesses during tour, of course. Uh, and uh, that is, uh, you just lie there in, uh, in a bathroom five minutes before the introduction starting. And, and, and you, you have some crew members looking at you thinking that it's important possible that this guy can do a fucking show today and then you just rise up and go to the stage and you you do the performance and the crowd usually don't notice but it's actually i, I used to always say that is there anything i don't like on tour yeah being sick because not not because it's uh, it's horrible being sick on tour but because you 
actually uh, feel you cannot deliver to the audience what you want to give because it's it's a, a thing you know we we want to be our best for every fan whoever sees a show no matter where the show is we want to be at our top and then if there is a uh, if there is a disease in our body that we can only give 50 percent there's very few moments when sabaton have uh, and not performed during sickness uh, and uh, actually that has never happened but we have performed in some other little variations of Sabaton during sickness so in 2006 in Lübeck uh, there was a, uh, uh, the doctors said Joachim by no means can perform during that show so we actually had our merchandise guy to step up and do the whole full show wow and uh, he, he learned the songs, he knew some of the songs, and he learned the other ones. And uh, he stepped up and did the full show. Uh, and uh, he, it was hilarious because the movie Rockstar uh, had just came out. I remember, yeah, I remember. He did the classic speech. Uh, I used to grow up with the posters of these guys on my walls, and now I'm one of them. So follow your dreams. <laughs> That was one of those uh, moments when uh, uh, when uh, we, we uh, stepped up and did the show no matter what. And actually, not so long ago, it was happening again. It was uh, a concert in France on the on the festival called Hellfest. So we had just performed in France, and it was an awesome show. And we are on the grounds of a festival that is about to start, and one of their headliners is uh, canceling their performance. And we are basically the only band who is able to step in and take the position of headlining uh, one of the biggest festivals in Europe, Hellfest. And uh, in early morning, I go up and I meet the promoter and he says, it's 100% on. The show is, is yours if you, if you want to step up and do the headline show tonight. And I said, yeah, we can do that. So I go to my production team and I say, OK, we have a show tonight. Pack, unpack, load up the gear and um, the stage is ours. And uh, everybody's excited. And then a little bit later, Joachim comes up and he can't speak. He doesn't have any voice. And I'm like, Joachim, you know, we have a show tonight. And he's like, uh, 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 uh. but we know that Joachim is exactly like you said uh, earlier, that once the, the intro starts, he's, he, it's just, it just goes away and he can sing. And uh, we go to the stage, yeah. we start the show, Joachim sounds horrible and 40,000 people is wondering what the... But it's going on on the stage. And then it's like, okay, we're going to try something. I'm stepping out. The other guys in the band, uh, let the lead guitarists show what they can do. And uh, I'm stepping out. So Joachim actually went and we, uh, we had a little table on, in the back of the stage, a dining table. And we invited a couple of fans onto the stage to drink and eat with Joachim. And then uh, the rest of us finished the show without him. And uh, at the end of the show, we had 40,000 people standing with hearts like this yeah. and, and saying, thank you for, for stepping up. Thank you for doing an absolutely awesome show. Well, that is an absolutely awesome show. Wow, I wish I had been at that show, man. That sounds fantastic. <laughs> Let's get Joachim sick sometime so that it can happen again. <laughs> So we have the merchandise to step up. Oh, yeah, of course. I shouldn't actually be saying that during Corona. And now, just in case people haven't seen any of our content the last few weeks, I've actually been sick with Corona. I'm fine now, but I was sick for weeks, and it is horrible not to the point where I shouldn't make any jokes about it. Now, you, pair, you just got tested, and you just got, what does it say? I'm negative. free. <laughs> I'm safe. <laughs> it is negative. So you will be allowed to leave Russia and go home soon, yes? Yes. That's okay. True. That's great, which, which means that um, in the not-too-distant... Which too means we're soon going to film in Bavaria. Well. Yeah, that's what I'm thinking. So soon we'll be able to stop doing these total isolation ones and we can isolate together. Okay, well, that is all for today. Um, but uh, once again, from Indy and isolation in Bavaria, goodbye. And from Pal in isolation in Moscow, thank you for this week. We'll see you next time on Sabaton History.
thank you everybody for watching and thank you everybody for supporting. And those who don't do it, click the bell, subscribe and become a patron. Thank you very much. Thank <laughs> you.